Welcome to another weekend here on the platform. My name is Sam Omashe. On this program this week, I will be speaking with Peter Eagle and Tosi Eagle. But before the lineup, my column will be read to you now. The understated man of the hour is not George Floyd, who could not breathe, but MKO Abiola, who stopped breathing over two decades ago. It is not because of June 12. The conferment of the public holiday is a local validation. For this hour, Abiola is a world hero. But few remember this, just as racial amnesia make white men and women of prejudice balk at the crumbling of statues dedicated to personages of tyranny. Few know that Abiola was the moving spirit of reparations for Africa as far back as 1991. He did not yell here alone. He took the fight to the United States and the United Nations. He set up an office coordinated by Frank Igwebweze and his newspaper, The Concord, megaphoned the agitation. The Congressional Black Caucus hosted him a few times. A man of money, Abiola mobilized men and resources for this cause. Abiola was an unlikely man to be a hero of democracy. Those who apprehended his ambition thought he loved life too much to give a fight. Heroes, as history has often shown, do not come in neat packages. The military elite and his mockers in the civil society hardly expected that not a Ghani Fawaimi or Alao Akabasharu would lead the country's rumble for liberty. He did not only fight. If freedom mattered here, Abiola became a martyr. But he was an accidental hero. But he embraced both accident and heroism. In the case of June 12, Abiola turned an accident into a cause. But with reparation, he turned out to be the champion with a self-conscious zeal. Two news stories put this in perspective last week. One, the Bank of England confessed to its role in funding the transatlantic slave trade. Two, Lloyds also owned up to providing insurance to ship human beings from Africa via England to the Americas. These are institutions that fattened on racial misery. Abiola knew this as a businessman. He said the West should pay. Whites and the West heard, but didn't listen. They looked the other way. Abiola saw it before others. He did not abandon it, and he expected to use the scaffolding of the Nigerian presidency to eventualize the idea. Just like many things African, we can be our own worst enemies. We obstructed him to obstruct us. This is an opportunity of the Buhari administration. It can take advantage of the fever of black rights in the world to push Abiola's idea on the world stage. But it will not be about the reparations alone. It will be a ballast to address the question of racism and pulled out in the infrastructure of prejudice. The world has not addressed black violence, especially slavery, other than abolish. They did not want to abolish it out of charity. To quote my teacher, Professor B.O. Olorontimei, the abolition of slave trade was an act of enlightened self-interest by the Europeans to give the Africans a new role in international economic system. They did not love blacks. They loved money. They set the black free to make money. The issue of race was never been addressed in the World Conference. There's never been a truth and reconciliation moment on race. We need a world protocol of race such as the Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. We can set all this in motion. With Gambari beside him, President Buhari can take the chance. Give me a place to stand and a level long enough and I will move the world, declared Achimedes. Buhari has a chance to be the world's first citizen. Uh, Peter Higo, your, your forte was television. And, yes. and uh, his forte is actually celluloid or film. 
What yes. of your legacy do you think people like Tosin are picking up? Well, the one of the things I think uh, Tosin may not have mentioned is that the NTA family is quite big and large. And mm -hmm. um, I recall those days in the VI when we were, uh, I was in VI, Victoria Island, the studios in VI. And they were in school, they, just next door to the studio at Drao. And every time they closed, they would come to my office and uh, sit outside or go to the studios. So everyone in the uh, premises knew them. They knew all the producers. They knew all my colleagues. They knew everyone. They grew up in that broadcast large family. And um, uh, so he talked about Tales by Moonlight. And of course, all the producers and the designers and all crew were all there. And they would, as they waited in my secretary's office for me, mm. while I was in the office to, before they took them home, they would discuss with them, they would mix with them and all of that. So they knew a lot of all that. And so that is one of the legacies, growing up in the uh, atmosphere and watching broadcasts and watching the actors, watching that. I think that must also have inspired them. Okay, yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you want to say something, Tosi? I say yes, yes, that's true. We were at NCA every time from school. I, I, even in Tales by Moonlight, I, sometimes I was one of the children. Um, even in children's world, the number of shows that I would be around, okay, what, Tosi, why don't you participate? So I was on some shows as well. Okay. As a, yeah. mm -hmm. Now, your, uh, your father's um, area has been in directing and so on and so forth, also telling two stories and writing. Yours is a little expanded. You are also a storyteller. You are also a singer. You are kind of uh, a renaissance person in that, in that regard. <laughs> why, why do you think you have expanded that? Did you, you said you got no. storytelling from your dad. Yes. No, I think in general terms is the the way the, you know how um, um, in the future a lot of things are easier. So now it, it's possible for me to be a director, an editor, because the a, a cinematographer or a sound designer, because now the technology is available. I'm sure if all these things were available at the time, I'm sure my dad would have, but back then you would have needed extensive this before this. You have to shoot on the celluloid before you watch the thing. But now while we're on set, we can see our exposure is one button, everything is there. So a lot is easier. So once you have an idea, so it's easier for me to be able to, you know, um, acquire the knowledge for all these um, technical places and be able to do a lot of things. So I think that is, it still comes from the same place. It's just that the technology is there and it was not there at that time. That's why I would say I can do a, a number of more things now. Okay, Peter Ego, it looks like uh, one will want to know whether you feel like if we were today, you would have done better with all those programs that you had because we didn't have the technology uh, that we have today when you were, we were churning out those films like um, Samanja, Mirror in the Sun, and, and all the rest of them. Yes, I mean, clearly there's been a difference, a big difference in... Uh, especially technology, but um, and um, um, let me give for example when when I shot Cock Crow at Dawn, um, uh, well even before Cock Crow at Dawn, when, in, when we started as pioneers of NTA Sokoto, uh, there was no studio basically yeah, in the proper studio sense. So the store converted to we had to build our sets there and shoot. And we were shooting live. There were no, there were no, we, we, there were no editing facilities of on, at, at that time. You just had your crew and your artists ready in the studio. And once it is time for your program live, they come to your studio. One come uh, stand by, and they came to your studio. And you, your actors perform live on air. There was no margin for error, and all that. So that was the uh, the kind of um, tr work ethics we had at that point. So we, you had to really rehearse and rehearse and prepare well so that you don't make uh, mistakes when it came to that. And the only recording ability at that point was the celluloid, uh, the, not even 16mm, it was the 8mm uh, mm. for news, the Bolex camera for recording news. So I had to begin to move out of the studio uh, because... I, I needed to my productions to, if you like, have a breath of fresh air, 
And uh, before or by my time, the existing programs are all studio based. Village Headmaster, Samanja, and Masquerade, they had been on before my time. And they were all studio based programs. But in Sokoto, they were confronted by the lack of space and studio. Necessity became the mother of invention. I started moving out of the studio, writing my story, going out to the streets, going out to the market and all that. And so we are clear. Uh, uh, we, 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 I am uh, described as the person who uh, created shooting out on location. Um, uh, so, so I moved drama out of the, the studio to location, and Kokura Dome was the first ever drama series shot entirely on location. And even then, to shoot Kokro, I had to shoot on film. There were no video cameras. I had to shoot on the, the 16mm uh, camera. Then, when I shoot, I do not see what I shoot. I just have the word of my cameraman to say, look, cameraman, are you happy with what we've done? He said, yes. And they said, okay, let's take a second take. Then we should, because film was also expensive, you have to rehearse and rehearse before you do a take. Then I had to send my film to London for, uh, uh, for processing. And then they would process and then send me reports, not even the film, just send me reports to say, okay, so and so uh, role, uh, okay, uh, technically, uh, the lights fine, all of that. But I do not see the acting, whether it's good enough, until I now go to editing in London when I go to edit. So that was the kind of way we were shot. It, it took, after I shot 13 episodes of Cockro on film, celluloid. But of course, it was expensive, it was time consuming, and all that. And it was Engineer Maduka, our DG then, who said, look, we can't continue with this expensive, time-consuming, difficult part for you. So they shifted, they, they, he sent me and my cameraman to London to study this new equipment that just come, the mo, uh, video camera for shooting <laughs> out on location. <laughs> so that was how we transferred from film to video. Of course, so for them, Josie and Co now, it's easier. But even there, when we shot on video, to edit... You had three humongous big machines, two, uh, three machines to edit with. It would occupy a whole room to edit. But right now, uh, uh, like Tosi will tell you, he just needs his computer and he's there. And he will do his own editing. He will do his own. Uh, to edit when I was doing Cockro, at least the first 30 episodes, even later when I went to a video, I had an editor, a picture editor. Then I would then go sit down with the sound editor who now lay all the tracks, all the music and the track, full steps and all that. Um, so we needed more personnel to work there. And of course, I didn't have the technology, tech, uh, I didn't have the ability to edit whether audio or picture. And um, but the young ones play with the computer every day and all that. We now to edit, you don't need all those big, huge machines. It has become smaller and smaller and smaller. And um, so, and in our own time, it used to be big, great to be known as a pro writer, producer, director yeah. in the BBC mold. Yeah. So to be a writer, producer, and director was all that was the height of it all. Mm. But for Tosi, because he, way of his, the way he started, play with cameras, you got to know how to shoot, the, use the camera. And then, of course, as a music person, how to, he understood the sound and how to produce the sound and lay it and all that. And then, so adding that with his ability to write, produce, and direct, enriched him more mm. than uh, our own time. Mm. So they are better for him because they are better trained in all those aspects. Mm. So I do not want to say if I have those, I would do better. I, I don't think, I don't know if I can. They have, have the facilities, they have the resources. But also, there are, don't forget that in this industry, you are as good as what you put into uh, the, your production. At the end of the day, there are many who have the facilities, who have the same resources, but they don't have the same drive or creativity to utilize them in a better way. Mm. So um, I, I give kudos to them, yeah. uh, to Tosi and his yeah. uh, people for what they're doing and uh, yeah, using how they're using the new technology well. Yeah, Tosi, I would like to know, which one gives you the, the more pleasure? Is it the music part or the film part? The, the, you know, the film part, the, the film part. Why so? The film, film and television part. Because, Why so? I mean, it's, 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 it's more enjoyable creating um, something over the space and time. And basically, storytelling is, um, is more emotional. And the benefit for it is like, if, I'm, if you're doing music, you're making music. 
But if you're making film, you're also making music. You understand? It's an embodiment. So making film still embodies making music. So, you know, it combines. So you're still doing both things. But when you're making music alone, you're making music. You're not, you know. What is your own vision to sing? How would you say mm -hmm. your generation is different from your father's in terms of your own vision of what a good film is and what a subject matter should be for this time? I think what, what a good film has always been for me is like, you know, you can watch a, you can watch a terrible picture, um, but this, if the story is very good, then there's something there. So the story for me is always the first thing. If it's a wonderful story you're telling, I think that's why, um, although let's say in foreign countries, they might say, okay, are watching our, some of the Nollywood movies, even if some of the productions are not that great, but the story is so amazing that these movies have traveled around the world. The stories are always selling because the story is the most important thing. Once the story is good, you have a good film. And once you can just tell that story accurately, it becomes amazing. And that's what I think uh, it makes a good film for me. No matter how glamorous the picture, all those things are benefits. If the story is there and very strong, mm. all those things will help make it great. Mm. Then I'd say sub subject matter. The truth is, the way, the way Nigeria is now, the way the industry is now for us, certainly the new people uh, trying to make, make it in the film industry, it's a lot different from back then, you know? Now it's more or less you are, um, you are uh, is it, there's a thing they call it the film entrepreneur. You, you basically make your film, find out how to make money from it yourself and sell it yourself. So you need to understand that you are, you are a film entrepreneur in the industry today. It's not like um, um, the time when, let's say like, you know, I, I, I could have been, if, because the truth is, if time was the same, I'd probably be working in NTA. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. If time was the same, I'd be working in NTA. I'd probably gone through NTA, the same process, but because of the way the country is now, we are becoming film entrepreneurs. That's why we are, you know, understanding a lot more. It's better for you to know how to shoot, direct, produce a number of things because that's how, that's what I would benefit you being a film entrepreneur. You have to be a producer, know how to get your film to the cinema, sell it, know how to make your own money back. You, you, you have to understand all these things. Mm. So that's how the industry is for us. And Subject matters now is now more or less we are becoming we're also becoming marketers trying to understand what target market we're targeting, who we want to watch the film, who are making this product for. So it now depends if you're going to make a film for finance, you have to know okay, I'm making this film directly to sell and I have to make it for this target market. If I'm making this film to go to festivals or whatever the case is, I'm going to make a film for this one. So like I said, we are basically becoming film is that low slogan now film the film entrepreneur. Okay. I remember yes. when I was teaching media in the United States, I, there was one question I always asked them. Uh, I said, said, the challenge of Hollywood as an art is that it is a business. And that the challenge of Hollywood as a business is that it is an art. So you have to see how the art and the business can come yes. together. Is it possible yes. in pursuing this that one will suffer for the other? that you cannot have great art without business interfering and vice versa? No, I think, I think, I think once you become a, a producer, you can basically say, okay, look, um, I'm going to make a film that will cover both directions. And the idea is, first of all, is for instance, let's say I want to make a film about um, spiritualism. The first thing I, I, I do is I'll go, maybe I'll go on Facebook or go somewhere and search for groups of people who are already in that field, who are interested in Mami Water or interested in that one, and maybe start writing messages to find out, are you, would you guys be interested in watching a film in that direction? So the idea is, if you might be making a film that is art, you know, and you are making a film for business, and because of the business, it might become great art. That's art in the industry today. So if I was making a film for those um, Mami Water people, I made a documentary, let's say I make a documentary, and I take it to the right people, that art becomes the big, biggest business for me because um, that's what I'm producing and I've done research. If I wanted to make a film now about, um, let's say about high life, partying or whatever the case, let's say the people who like to go out and the lifestyle in Nigeria, you'd have to find the audience, because not everybody that's into the high life that will actually buy your film. Mm. So, uh, so that's what I'm saying. So the, what we're doing now is before we make a project, we have to do the research into it. <coughs> so I say for producers now, 
It's not about the compromise of the art and the business. It's a choice that you make. So if you're about to make a film that you project, okay, there are 10,000 people that are going to buy it, you make the film at a lesser price, yeah. even in the art you want to make and sell it to that direction. Mm -hmm. So like I said, so we, but we can still enjoy doing art in that form and doing business. But generally, generally, we, we enjoy doing art a lot more than doing the business. Mm -hmm. But like I said, we don't have a choice. We are the film entrepreneurs. You cannot think about the art alone. You have to think about the business. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Well, uh, they come in here. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like you said, sometimes when you concentrate on, it's okay, I have something wonderful I want to talk about. It may not be commercially viable, but it's a wonderful work of art. And you can dwell on it, and then you will not make money. But that's not your objective. You just wanted to something that people will appreciate, even if it's not what they call a box office hit and all that. Okay. But sometimes you go because it's a commercial thing and you shoot it, mm -hmm. not caring whether the content is artistically um, high level or no. Yeah. So like them, you have to keep adjusting okay. to uh, depending on what your objective is. Okay. And there's sometimes uh, I recall that. Uh, uh, some years back, Cockroach uh, Don was selected for viewing in the, the U.S. Uh, at the South Carolina. Uh, South Carolina and uh, once you, your project is uh, selected, you go there and discuss among producers. It's not a market. It's a discussion among producers mm -hmm. of public institutions. So people came from BBC, from the Canadian Television, and all that. And I came from my program was selected from NTA, and um, I talked about, uh, where, uh, they would ask me questions about Cockroach Don and I would answer and all that and all that and all that. At the end of it, all, the lady came to me to say, I want to come to Nigeria to shoot something. I've been in Nigeria. I've studied the, because Tosi mentioned it, I was in Oguta and I spent one year studying the healing powers of Mami Water. I looked at the quiet lady and I said, are you serious? She said, yes. And I said, what do you want to go and shoot? Uh, spend one year studying the healing power of Mami Water. He said, well, there are people who are interested in those kind of things, yes. anthropological issues and all that. Yes. And I said, okay. So she anyway, to cut a long story short, she came to Nigeria. I gave her a camera crew on film, and she went to Guta and shot this uh, document, which is still uh, available. On the, she called it my water. She used the Victor Waifu's music, mm -hmm. and um, she made a lot of money from it. And I asked her how. She said, look, don't forget that in America, there are very, there are just like, well, you said you thought uh, art in America. She said there are over 50, 50 universities or more, more than that who have departments of African studies, but they have no content. Yes. So when she takes those kind of content, that's the kind of thing they want to see anthropological. They don't want to see your uh, your um, people lifestyle running, lifestyle. driving cars and all that. Yes, yeah. They don't do that. They see both. Yeah, they lifestyle, that. Lifestyle. they yes. want to see something anthropological yes. and something that for them is what is relevant. Something and she exotic. came back in to shoot another documentary yeah. on the building block called Tubeli, the Hausa building block called Tubeli. Mm. And she, she, she wanted to see all our mosques and all our palaces in the mm. north. Okay. And she shot that as a wonderful. So again, it depends on what you want to ask. The okay. art as she... Sometimes they both come together. Yes. Doing it yes. what's relevant and also making money from that. We could go on and on and on and on uh, on this yeah. interview, but um, <laughs> but uh, uh, asking me, okay, let us let us wrap up. But I can't do that without asking Tosin about um, how I was able to get uh, very briefly how we were able to get the big stars for seven people like uh, Sadiq Daba, people like uh, Daddy Shoki, um, <laughs> Mufed Amijo, and so on, and then. <laughs> We hear that you are trying to do a remake of yes. Neka the Pretty Serpent. Just a few sentences to just uh, give us uh, an insight into, into these uh, endeavors. Basically, the honest truth is um, they all know that I come from a good pedigree. So when you, are, when you walk in the room and say, oh, we know your dad, they know. And most of the times, uh, someone like RMD had seen a production at short. And he was very impressed with that. So he was very willing to work. Um, Daddy Shoki, once, once uh, I think I asked my dad to help me reach out to Daddy Shoki because Daddy Shoki had worked with my dad when he was young, uh, when he was when Daddy Shoki was very young. So once um, my dad spoke to Daddy Shoki, from there I met him. I mean, Daddy Shoki are still very close to today. We talk almost every two or three days, you know. And we all know. Uh, Today, Daba used to put me on his lap, you know. <laughs> 
and two men is love. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I've, I've, I've noticed ever since. So that was not even a, a big problem, you know. So, and uh, but basically the experience, and it was wonderful to work with them. I'm still grateful that he came on board and we made that great production, and it's you know won the awards that he won everywhere, and you know, that was amazing. But, yeah. And then in Eka, the uh, pretty serpent. Yeah. Isaac coming Ineka along. Yeah, no, we're, we're in pre-production now. Okay. We're in pre-production. We're planning. We're okay. looking to do something very great. Okay. So we have had uh, Peter Igo and Tosi Ingo, father and son, displaying talent for a generation and intergenerationally. Thank you very much for being on this show. Uncle Peter. Thank you very much and for inviting us. Thank you very much. We are honored to be on your show. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. We hope, we hope we can come back. Sure. Sure. <laughs> this is the Emya of Katsina and his entourage in London. How times change. No monarch will do that today. Yesterday's novelty is today's commonplace. Just before the program ends, this is my poem in honor of Leah Sharibu. Don't say good morning, Leah, to the husband so-called. Because whether you bow or kneel or stand erect, you do no homage. To the first light, dew or cockcrow at dawn. For the man who snapped your own first lash has made a casket of your youth. Thank you for watching the program today. You can catch up with my published column on www.samomashe.com. Also follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Sam Omashe. And until next time, be good.